we are going to wrap up um, our journey through the book of Nehemiah. We've been in there all summer long, and today is a chance to, to close to close that book. Um, and it's kind of a, it's almost a bitter sour closing, um, but um, hopefully um, it's still a challenge to all of us as uh, we wrap up this particular uh, book of the Old Testament. So Nehemiah chapters 12 and 13, the story here is what happens when we misplace our passions and what that means in terms of losing our way and loving God. So before I jump into that, I just want to ask you if you would, let's just take a moment. Let's just pray together, ask God to open up our hearts um, as we hear from him through his word. Let's pray together. So God, we are grateful that you still speak today. God, you're not some silent, distant God who kind of wound up the universe and then went away. No, God, you are active today. You are moving today. And so, Lord, as we look into your word today, may what we see here, may what we hear uh, in your word, may it motivate us to be the kind of people uh, that you have called us to be, that you want us to be. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. I want to start um, this morning with a story that may seem like it doesn't really has much to do with the close of Nehemiah, but it really does. There was a German pastor by the name of Martin Rinkert, and he served in the walled town of Eilenburg during the horrors of the Thirty Years' War. Now, if you know anything about European history, the Thirty Years' War did not last for 30 years. I don't know why they call it the Thirty Year War, but that war lasted a lot longer than 30 years. But he was a pastor uh, in a German town. And what happened was the town, Eilenburg, it became an overcrowded refuge, as people tend to do when there is war, even this morning as we're hearing about uh, wars and we're hearing about bombing and so on and so forth that's taking place in the Middle East. People run. They, they look for refuge. And in this case, during the Thirty Years' War, um, this town became a refuge uh, for people uh, from the surrounding area. The, the people who were running from and to and away from, they were suffering uh, from uh, uh, from an epidemic and from famine. And in 1637, 1637, the year of what's known as the Great Pestilence, there were four, there were four pastors in this town of Eilenburg, but one of them abandoned his post for health reasons, and he could not be persuaded to return. So, Pastor Rinkhart officiated at the funeral of the other two. That left him as the only pastor left. And he often conducted services for as many as 40 to 50 people per day. Some 4,400 people in all. In May of that year, his own wife died. And by the end of the year, the refugees who had been running and trying to find safety had to be buried in trenches without services. Yet living in this world that was dominated by death, Pastor Reinhardt, he wrote the following prayer for his own children to offer to the Lord. This may sound familiar. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices. What wondrous things hath done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath led us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Friends, as we wrap up this series from the book of Nehemiah, our final two chapters, they're going to demonstrate why the worship, the love of Yahweh must remain central to our lives. No matter what happens, no matter what the pestilence, no matter what we are fleeing from, no matter where we seek refuge, we have to remember to keep God at the center of our lives, 
And we also have to remember what happens, what could happen when we allow that same passion for him to fade. Here's what I want you to remember as you leave today. When we engage in the work that God calls us to, we must never neglect to celebrate what he's done. For when we do, we will forget who he is. We will forget who God is. So this is a lot of this is a lot in the Bible to cover. Chapters 12 and 13. You could actually do an entire eight-week series just on these two chapters. And so forgive me uh, for not being able to dive in a bit more uh, to these chapters. But I want us to start by looking at Nehemiah chapter 12, which gives us a powerful image of what it means to celebrate God's mighty acts. And what we witness here in this particular chapter of Nehemiah is a, a celebration and dedication of this completed wall of the city, as we've been talking about. That's why Nehemiah has come back, to, to rebuild the, the city wall around Jerusalem. And what we find here in chapter 12 are the names of all of the priestly leaders, all of the people, the Levites. They're all listed here in this chapter, name after name, family after family. They're all recounted. Nehemiah lists 22 leaders of the priests who returned, actually, uh, from captivity in Babylon about 100 years prior, and they'd come back with Zerubbabel. And you find that in verses 1 through 7. And what Nehemiah kind of painstakingly lays out in, in these verses here in chapter 12, it's it's a, it's a witness, in fact, to the faithfulness of God, the preservation of all of these families and all of their familial lines. And it's all a reminder that God's faithfulness, God is faithful to his people even though they had sinned mightily against him. God was still making sure to preserve his people Israel so that they would, in fact, return to the land that he had promised through their ancestor, Abraham, centuries before. And as we discussed a few weeks back, Nehemiah purposefully and intentionally, he worked to in increase the numbers of those who lived within this rewalled city of Jerusalem. And now it's time to, to take time to kind of solemnly dedicate, worship God for this mighty act that's been accomplished through all of those who had engaged in this rebuilding effort under Nehemiah's leadership. This is what we read, beginning in verse 27 of Nehemiah chapter 12. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs and thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. The musicians also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophagites, from Beth Gilgal, from the area of Geba, from Azmevet. For the musicians had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. And so while the people are here to dedicate the mighty act of God through the rebuilding of this wall, it's something there's something I want you to really take note of that comes to us in this verse, verse 30. When the priest and the Levites, when these religious leaders had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people. They purified the gates and the wall. This is what's important to note about this one verse. We don't get details in this text exactly what this purification is. We just know that it happened. But what we really should notice is there's an emphasis here on holiness. The leaders of God's people must be sensitive to the things that could defile them. They must constantly be cleansed in order to be holy instruments to be used by God. Holiness is one of the central themes 
of the Bible, and it is something that God calls us all to. But there's something else that happens here in chapter 12 that's equally impressive. Considering all the difficulties that kind of are attached to this rebuilding and this repairing of the walls and getting people to move back into this abandoned city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah assembles what appears clearly to be significant numbers of people to lead in a choir. Think about that. Have any of you had to lead a choir? Anybody here ever led a choir? Raise your hand. So nah, y'all don't know what it's like. Leading a choir is a lot of work. I've led a couple. It is a ton of work. And Nehemiah assembles these choirs. Here's, here's what I read about this. It had to be an impressive celebration. The passage reminds us that we have to find ways to unite the community, to glorify God together. Special celebrations that, that help the believing community. They're a testimony also to people who don't know who God is. And the emphasis here is that this is kind of a, a continuation of what David, King David, many hundreds of years before had started. The musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God, you'd find that a little bit later on in this same chapter. And it reminds us that an understanding of our place in history, our solidarity with former generations of Christians, that's vital. We have to see ourselves as part of God's continuing plan. And so this is an unforgettable opportunity to be grateful for, to celebrate God's mighty acts. And no doubt it is purposed in part to encourage us to do the same. There is a writer by the name of Henri Nouwen, and he says this. I love this. He says, to be grateful for the good things that happen in our lives that's easy, right? To be grateful for the good things, right? But to be grateful for all of our lives, the good and the bad, well, the moments of joy as well as the moments of sorrow, the successes as well as the failures, the rewards as well as the rejections, that requires hard spiritual work. And still, we are only truly grateful people when we can say thank you for all that has brought us to the present moment. As long as we keep dividing our lives between events and people we would like to remember and those we would rather forget, we cannot claim the fullness of our beings as a gift of God to be grateful for. Now, in concludes with this, he says, let's not be afraid to look at everything that has brought us to where we are now and trust that we will soon see it in the guiding hand of a loving God. And I think that's what was going on with the people here in Nehemiah chapter 12. They were celebrating both the good and the stuff that was tough. And as we approach the end of our journey through the book of Nehemiah, we see that the people under Nehemiah's leadership, they, they worship God for his mighty acts, but then there's something that happens in the final chapter of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 13. And it's what happens. It's what happens when we forget about God's mighty acts. I want to read a passage of Scripture. I want us to read this together. It's a pretty long, it's a pretty long text, but I think it's important that we read, this, read through this together. Nehemiah chapter 13. I want to begin in verse 4. <clears throat> we read these words. Before this, Eliashib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him, Tobiah, he had provided Tobiah, with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priest. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. 
Who is the I that's not in Jerusalem? Nehemiah. He says, all this happens. I'm not there. He says, I'm not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. He says, I gave orders to purify the rooms. Then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. Did, did, did you catch what was going on here? You, you get this? Nehemiah notices when he comes back that some changes have taken place back in the land after rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, after the repopulation of the city of Jerusalem, after the reinstatement of the religious leadership and of the people, and after that, that celebration that, envi- that involved the what? what, what? That involved the choirs, and they were celebrating what God had accomplished. Something is out of place. Something is off center. There is, in the words of Nehemiah, evil afoot amongst the nation that's taken root while he had temporarily returned to his cup-bearing duties in the court of King Artaxerxes. Now, when you read through the book of Nehemiah and you read all the history uh, that comes to us from that time in the world, no one's exactly sure how long Nehemiah had been gone from from Jerusalem and then returned to find the things in the state that they were. But here's the truth. While he was gone, some rather startling things took place in Judah. Changes involving serious violations of the Mosaic law. And when, the, and when Nehemiah once again returned to Ju- Judah, he faced a task that I bet in some ways was even more challenging than the first time he came and had to rebuild the wall. Because now the people have everything that they didn't have before, and he's got to call them out because they have disobeyed God. I think it's safe to say, after all of his incredible and intentional work, Nehemiah, I can only imagine, was probably livid. I can imagine kind of this anger, the frustration, disappointment with the people, their lack of spiritual fervor. After all that God had accomplished through them and for them, this is what he says. This is what he, this is what he says in verse 10 of chapter 13. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. Stop just a minute. The people weren't feeding the people they were supposed to feed, and then not only that, said, now you guys got to get back to work. Yeah, we know you're supposed to do the things over here for God, but here's what we're telling you. You're not doing that anymore. Hit the road, Jack. Nehemiah says this. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their post. The idea that the people who would have been watching and guarding the very spiritual life of the city had not been doing their job. Interestingly enough, I came across another account that explains why why it's key to have certain people assigned to keep watch over certain things and the difference those people can make. Did you know During the late medieval period, London had a very strange law on their books. Each and every gate into the city 
had to keep a musician on duty. Isn't that great? Every city gate had a musician. No, that's really weird. They had musicians at every city gate. Now, now, it was a very dangerous job, actually. City gates were where attackers and other threatening outsiders, that's where they first show up. But these musicians were like the border patrol. But they gave the job to musicians. And as strange as it sounds, musicians took charge of many of the essential services back then. These hired municipal minstrels, they, they began then showing up everywhere, all over Europe, around the year 1370. They typically would play instruments, wind instruments, like trumpets, trombones, and fifes, bagpipes, recorders, percussion. Now, to the modern mind, mu musical skills and police responsibilities have very little in common. But in an earlier age, those two roles overlapped. Musicians not only helped defend the city gate, but they might be required to patrol the streets at night. I'm reading this story and I'm thinking, this is getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> so I got a guy who's playing guitar roaming the streets at night. You know? But listen to this. In Norwich, which is a town, a village in England, in the year 1440, they established a tax to pay these musicians as they wandered the streets. These musicians were required to take an oath of office. Then in Germany, the minstrels were expected to acquit himself well as a swordsman. What? Why musicians? Here's the most obvious answer. Musicians were idealist first responders. Why? Because what could they do? They could sound the alarm in the case there was a major disturbance. Certainly a loud horn or a drum would help in that regard. Their signaling capacity of their musical instruments also explains to us now we see the drummer playing in, in a military band. That's where, that, that's where that image comes from. These are the people who were called to stand watch on the city gates and to alarm, let people know. And Nehemiah comes back from his responsibilities in the court of King Artaxerxes, and he finds that the people's passion for God has cooled considerably. You know, I've been talking about gates, I've been talking about musicians, but here's a few things that Nehemiah finds. He finds that there is working and there are people engaging in commerce on the Sabbath. You read that in chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. He finds that there is an ignoring of religious guidelines. He finds that there are married women who are not from the nation of Israel also bringing new life into the nation of Israel. And the people who are raising those children, they're not teaching them to speak the Hebrew language. We find that in verses 23 through 26. So even as this phenomenal story of Nehemiah, the rebuilder of walls, having successfully led the effort to reestablish the city of Jerusalem, to place at the center of life in that city, and in that part of the world, the faith, that calls people to follow the one true God, Yahweh. Something is not right. All it took, all it took was for Nehemiah to be briefly absent. And the very same people who had one point been so enthusiastic for God, now once again avert their gaze, they look away from that very same God. Nehemiah returns to find a people who have yet again seemingly forgotten what faithfulness to their God who embodies true faithfulness looks like. I have a cautionary tale I want to share with you. From the life 
of one of the most well-known and well-loved American writers and humorist. Samuel Longhorn Clemens. Anybody know who Samuel Longhorn Clemens actually was? Do you think you know? Mark Twain. And Mark Twain wasn't a Christian. How, did you, how many of you knew that? He was not a believer. Nor did he claim to be one when he began to court Olivia Langdon. Now, back in Twain's day, a man typically had to get permission from a woman's parents before marrying her. I did. Had to get permission, so I'm not that old, but it still happens, right? But that's what Mark Twain had to do. Mark Twain had a problem, however. He had a problem. Olivia Langdon came from a professing Christian family that would not allow their daughter to marry an unbeliever. To overcome that obstacle, Twain took on the guise of a spiritual seeker who needed the support and prayers of Olivia's family in order to clean up his life. Twain, influenced by Olivia's prodding, presumably he converted, Twain wrote to his mother after his engagement to Olivia, my prophecy was correct. Olivia's family was convinced that Mark Twain was a Christian. They permitted the marriage. But was Mark Twain's conversion an illusion? One scholar insists that Mark Twain was a man in love, wooing a woman he hoped to marry. And his religious feelings at the time, expressed in love letters to Olivia, disappeared as soon as the Wedding vows were exchanged. And after their wedding, Mark Twain actually ridiculed Olivia's belief, devotion. Soon, Olivia's optimism began to wane. Her fervent faith cooled. Eventually, she forsook her religion altogether in a deep sorrow, kind of deluged Olivia's life. Mark Twain loved her and he never meant to hurt her but he had broken her spirit. He said, Livy, Livy, if it comforts you to lean on your faith, do so. And she replied sadly, I cannot. I do not have any faith left. Mark Twain often wished he could restore Olivia's faith, hope, and optimism, but it was too late. An undermined faith, an undermined passion, forgotten, neglected faith and passion. Mark Twain's effort or lack thereof directly impacted the faith of his wife, Olivia, whose passion and faith for God then faded. I think that's the warning that comes to us from Nehemiah chapter 13. We're called to follow God into the work that he's called us to, to let no one, to let nothing else keep us, distract us, dishearten us from the work that he's called us to do. As great a work as Nehemiah, Nehemiah, this rebuilder, of broken walls. And so, as we wrap up this series, that would be the question that I want to have ringing in your heart. Where's your passion? Has it been set aside, set on a shelf? Are you still fire and eager for the things of God. Because if it's on the shelf, it's been set aside, it's easy to lose your way. The good news is, the really good news is, you are not lost. You can come back.
to this good God, this loving God. That's what he wants for you. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we have journeyed through the story of your people and Nehemiah, Lord, we know that without you, we can do nothing. God, when we partner with you, we can accomplish great things, and we thank you for the story, the true story that comes to us from this book. Great things done in your name. God, there's a cautionary tale as well. Lord, that if we forget, if we get distracted, if our gaze falls elsewhere, Lord, we can misplace that passion for you as well. Lord, may we be people who work diligently, who find ways, Lord, to always stoke a flame in our lives just for you. And God, we live in a world, Lord, that is looking for people like that. God, that is looking for people who really live what they say they believe. Lord, may we be those people. May we be challenged. May we be encouraged. Lord, may we become people who speak of your goodness, who live your goodness. Lord, who are known as people who are rebuilders, repairers. Lord, uh, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.